so much for your company this morning. It is the game that captivates our nation and our All Blacks are celebrated heroes closely watched by pretty much everyone. Mm -hmm. But what is life like once the final whistle sounds? Rugby writer Wynne Gray takes a look, a close look at what happens when rugby stops. But life continues in his new book, Rugby, The Afterlife. It is great to have you here, Wynne. Thank you. Yes, welcome. welcome. And before we get into talking about this, let's talk, mm. let's talk a little bit about you first. <laughs> We're turning the tables on a journalist. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I started in journalism at the defunct Auckland Star. Wow. Gosh. In, the, in the 70s. We'll leave it at that. With a typewriter? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh, did did my sort of probation period there, covering covering court, uh, doing the shipping news, all those sort of things, getting getting copy from from other journalists, running copy in the newsroom, uh, and on Saturdays working for another defunct newspaper, the Eight O'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that, but that was a well sought after newspaper that came out uh, sort of after pubs closed on a At Saturday night. Oh, okay. <laughs> Usually just a fraction before and everyone had been to the pub and they went and got a couple of pies in the eight o'clock on the way home. It was that sort of thing. And got all the sports results from around the country. Wow. That was how it worked then. And what led you to take an interest in particular in sport? Well, I'd, I'd worked in a, a number of other areas in, in police reporting when, when I was overseas a lot, political reporting those sort of things. But when I came back to New Zealand this time, I thought I really want to do something slightly different. Now, what is one of the bigger topics in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or not, it is sport. And it could be anything from netball to rugby to cricket. And so I put my hand up for it and, and started it. And look, you've been brilliant at it over the years, and still am, clearly, but the technology's changed a lot. And I can remember, I think it was last year, I was reading a story about you in the, um, was it the 1995 Rugby World Cup final? You basically found out about the food oh, poisoning, yeah. and you couldn't really report it, could you, because of the way technology was? That was probably one of the most frustrating times I've ever had as a journalist, where, uh, because of the deadlines, or different time frames between the countries, there I was... Uh, I'd been feeling sick myself. I'd, I'd picked up a bug or something. Went upstairs to the All Blacks hotel, saw the doctor. And when I was there, there were all this mass of bodies and very unwell people. And I'm going, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. We're a day out from the Rugby World Cup final and these guys have all fallen mm. over. And so clearly the All Black management and the doctor didn't want me there and they gave me a couple of pills and hurried me out down the <laughs> corridor. I but I knew did. something was up badly. But because of the deadlines, my, my uh, time frame, my deadline had passed in New Zealand. Wow. Yeah. So I'm sitting on this great story <laughs> with no avenue, no outlook, and I'm sure as hell not going to give it to one of my competitors. <laughs> I hoped it might last. It didn't, but... No, so you had the screen Very and you couldn't report yeah. it, but Correct. nowadays I guess we'd just tweet it out. Yeah, well, now I would have yeah. tweeted it, I would have rung the Herald, it would have gone online. Yes. Uh, I might have rung a radio station. TV station. Yeah. And you probably would have there done an Instagram story as well. So <laughs> yeah, I'm true. sure I would have, Mel, <laughs> yes. You've been, yeah. you've been around All Blacks a lot, obviously. What mm. do you think it actually takes to be a great All Black? Well, you've, it's, it's like any job. Uh, you have to do the groundwork, do the basics, work hard at your your foundations, if you like, and then build on those and keep doing it. And if you're not dedicated, it's like any job. Your jobs, if you don't work hard at it, you won't be successful. Yeah. You and can only, flair will only get you to a certain level and then it, then it stops. And there's a lot of pressure on All Blacks, isn't there? Because they can't really live a normal life. From your experiences looking at their lives, mm -hmm. have they been able to lead a normal life or is it completely different? Well, no, I think any All Black from, from the start of the game in this country has not led a normal life right. because it has been such a revered sport through the amateur area, and you've only got to think of people like George Nepia or Colin Meads mm. or even the controversial Keith Murdoch who died the yeah. other day, right. um, to know that it, people are fascinated by yes. the sport and by those who yeah. play in it. And it's just that in the professional world and where they have got paid more and the media has become wider and more intrusive and more demanding, 
that we know more. That's true. Um, with this book, you're looking at the, the All Blacks after they've left, mm. you know, once they've, they've hung up their boots. Is there a length of time that the average All Black has a career, or is it more like a how long is the length of a piece of string? It is that because they have to be very careful that when they start in this game and they're heading towards the top, an injury might stop them yeah. immediately. And I can think of a, a player called Jason Goldsmith who was a very young All Black and then got a dreadful knee injury and it wrecked his career, didn't play again. Right. So there he is at an at a early, early 20s, can't play. What do you do? And that's the scenario that has to be painted for these players by their agents and their managers and even their family, that this is fine for you to start off in your rugby career and go for it, but while you're doing that, wouldn't it be sensible to either go to night school to learn a trade mm. or to do <laughs> some papers in something while you can, mm -hmm. but you yeah. do have some downtime, or get a part-time job. If this teaches you anything, it's guys have a plan B. I think, <laughs> yes, it. yes. That's right. Uh, you can buy into a supermarket as well. Some of them have yeah. done that. A, done number quite of well. them yeah. a number of them. <laughs> so let's talk about the people you've got in the book. So which stories for you stand out? I know you'll probably say all of them, but you must have a couple of favourites. Well, there are some uh, there's some really interesting ones that you suddenly were sort of a little bit shocked, even though you thought you knew these people quite well. We feel a little bit sad reading the, them. The variety mm. in there and some... These, to be fair, are mainly stories about people who have made a success of their lives after right. rugby. I, I also happen to know, as do a number of people, about others who have not had such a great time of it since they hung up their boots and they found it very difficult. So this is the other... Th this is the mental side of, of the mm. whole thing as well. OK, and was there a pattern? So I'm looking at this name here. We've got Ian Jones, Michael Jones, Josh Cromfeld, Richard Lowe, Justin Marshall, mm. Kevin Mialamu, Glenn Osborne. <coughs> this is just some of the fantastic people you've covered. Yeah. Was there a common theme that you notice? Maybe a plan they put in place or something they had done so they were successful after rugby? I, I think the fact that they were they were persevering and that they were aware that, that. When, when the final whistle went, they weren't going to be handed mm. any job. They mm. had to do it for themselves or they had to call on people who they knew and said, could you point me yeah. in the right direction? Wow. Would you mind mentoring me? Would you help me? And it's interesting that because you talk, the, the older ones obviously didn't get as much support on the ground, but they had those contacts that they went to, like the Sean Fitzpatricks mm -hmm. and things. I was saying the younger ones now get a lot more advice than what they did. They do. And, and the ones before rugby went professional, for, you've got to remember though, they played rugby at the weekends and then Monday to Friday... Had a job. Had a job. Yeah. So they went back to work in the farm. And we'll all, we'll remember a very famous story after the 90, 1987 Rugby World Cup, which was amateur, more or less, and the All Blacks won it. And on the Monday morning, Craig Green, who played for the All Blacks, was back working as a roofer in Christchurch. Oh, no, crazy, that was how it, it was. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, love, I love the fact that you've taken time to investigate what happens, you know, because sometimes they can just disappear and you don't hear much about them. So go and grab this book and check it out. But you are an esteemed journalist, and I really want to know this from a sports writer. What do we do in New Zealand to stop our young All Blacks taking off and using money overseas for big contracts? What can we do to keep them in the country, or is that just inevitable that that's going to happen? It, it's inevitable. Okay. I mean, you, you just have to think. If you, say if you're a, a good rugby player but you only play at provincial level and someone from Japan or someone from uh, a part of Britain mm. comes to you with a very big contract and said, here you are. Are you going to turn yeah, that no, down? No, yeah. You're not. No. But, but the part you've got to be sensible about is to work, get some good advice around that and how you're going to make that money work for mm. you. Think about it, Mike. You're offered a job in America for a million bucks. Mm. What do you do? Stay mm. here or do you go and get that job? Oh, but I love New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I do love are stories about perseverance. Like, I'll give you one. Glenn Osborne. Yes. We all know Glenn Osborne. Mm. And, I, and I'm not telling stories out of school about Glenn that he, when he became a professional rugby player, it was, gee whiz, I, I, I can buy all the bells and whistles, I'll have a new push bike, I'll have a new car, I'll, have a, I'll buy a batch, I'll do this, that, the other, and it, some of that ran out quite quickly. But he then persevered and went into television, he then went and owned a string of butcher's shop, but the thing he'd always wanted to do in his life was be a policeman. Wow. And he always thought 
he wasn't bright enough to do it. And he sat down with a mate, went through, passed the exams, and is now a policeman in Whanganui, and he loves it. That is excellent. Hey, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Mm. Fascinating book, some really good stories, like Christian Cullen's story. A wins book, Rugby, The Afterlife, is a great read. It is available from all good bookshops right now. Yes, thanks for coming in.